today's lecture is going to be on voltammetry. So we're going to specifically talk now about um, voltammetry techniques uh, and how we're going to use them uh, and some of the fundamentals behind them. Uh, so voltammetry is just measuring a current as a function of voltage. Uh, and so the, um, uh, the field that we're going to look at today, and that's this is what we're going to do in lab, is simply we're going to apply some sort of voltage, and then we're going to see what current we get out. So what voltage are you going to apply? Well, it turns out there's, you can dream up just about a million ways to apply voltage. Um, so, if you were to dream up the simplest way, so this is voltage, uh, E is applied voltage, this is in volts, um, versus time, say in seconds, right? You would just say, say you wanted to just apply a constant potential. There's a name for this, this is called constant potential amperometry. Many people just call it amperometry. Um, and so, uh, with amperometry, then you have uh, a constant potential. So that's as simple as you can get, right? Still voltammetry um, doing that. Maybe if you wanted to get a little more complicated, right, you could take a step, right, or something like that. If you were to take a step, that's called chronoamperometry. But, you know, you only get information about two voltages. You say, I want to learn more than that. So what if I looked over time and I now decide I'll just sweep up there. Uh, this is called linear sweep. And if we decide I don't want to end up there and I need to come back down, right, then we have cyclic voltage. So that's just an example of lots of things. So um, there's lots of different ones. If you do a project on this, the computer knows how to do like 13 or 14 different functions um, that you can kind of look at um, and do. But in the lab, we're going to actually do cyclic voltammetry um, today. So let's talk a little bit about cyclic voltammetry. Uh, as I said, we're going to start with kind of linear sweep, only meaning we're not going to go back down. We're just going to scan up. Same thing as cyclic voltammetry. So let's start, say we start with molecule A, and we do an oxidation, um, sorry, a reduction reaction, right? A is going to gain electrons and going to go to P. So A plus N number of electrons goes to P. Um, and we do a linear scan. As we do this, uh, we would expect to see our signal goes something like this. Um, uh, and there's one caveat that I'm going to tell you about that's very important, actually. We're going to do it in a stern solution. So what's happening as we, as we scan our voltage along? As we scan our voltage along, there's not enough energy to do the reaction, right? So the reaction doesn't go, it doesn't go, it doesn't go. And then all of a sudden, we hit a potential where, we're, where it can drive it. So the, the amount of current we get is, uh, goes up. And then at a certain potential, we, lift, we go off, we get a steady state current that we call the limiting current. Uh, okay, so what is that, uh, what, what parameters can we get out of here? We can look at what is the current when I'm at half of the height. So this is, that's the limiting current is the maximum I can get. I sub L over 2 would be equivalent to E1 half, so the, the half. And E1 half, it turns out, is approximately equal to that standard state potential that we talked about before. So that tells you something about the potential that the reaction can happen at. Um, so that's the, um, uh, that's the E1 half uh, for, um, it tells you about uh, the thermodynamics again, if you watch the basic electric chemistry lecture. Uh, E0 tells you about the thermodynamics of the reaction. So we can get that out. Limiting current um, uh, is, uh, um, is um, governed sort of uh, by um, 
kinetics, and so the limiting curve is equal to some sort of constant, and we'll talk about what this constant is in a minute, times the concentration of A. So that makes electrochemistry quantitative. Meaning the current you get out is proportional to the concentration that you have. So you can use this to determine concentrations. Um, and in fact, in the lab, we'll try and determine the concentration of acetaminophen and the tool is Tylenol, um, as far as that's concerned. All right, so let's talk a little bit about stirring. What is stirring? Um, in order to get this, we actually need to stir. So stirring um, uh, is a way of being basically doing forced convection. Right, so you're making the solution swirl around. So let's look at it from the electrode's perspective. So this is my electrode, and I'm stirring my solution out here, right? So my solution then is undergoing turbulent flow. When I get closer to the electrode, uh, because of the size of the electrode, it ends up that the um, flow streams start to kind of line up and be parallel. So really close to the electrode, we get laminar flow. But it turns out in this little area here, we can't um, use our uh, stirring to get the electrode to go only so, to get the solution, sorry, to go only so close to the electrode. And so in this little region, there's no flow. And so this region, they often give the symbol delta. It's called the Nernst diffusion layer. Um, and how long is the nerve diffusion light? Well, it's not very much. It's like 10 angstroms, something like that, right? So you, the flow can get it pretty close. But from here, this is as close as it can ride the wave, basically. Uh, and from there, the molecule would have to diffuse to the electrode surface. So we're always going to be diffusion limited, um, that uh, we can't flow quite to the surface. But by flowing, right, we, we get this um, area near the electrode um, to... Uh, to be um, uh, uh, have a have uh, analyte by it. What if we don't flow? So what if we have no stirring, no sort of convection going on? What happens then to the electrode? Right. Well, what happens? Let's try and look at. Let's call this the electrode. I'm going to look at the distance away from the electrode, right? And we're going to start out with some sort of concentration of A in the bulk solution. So that's what that's going to mean. CA star is just going to mean concentration of A in the bulk solution. All right, well now I apply a potential, this electrode is sufficient, we'll apply a negative potential, we'll do a reduction, sufficient to do the reaction, right? Uh, and so now the concentration is going to start to dip at the electrode. So that might be time one and time two, and time three, and time four, so this is increasing time. Right, and then over time, it just keeps going. Uh, and so what we say we do is we form a depletion area at the electrode. Why is that, right? Well, I'm doing my reaction at the electrode, so I'm forming, A goes to P in this case, that's the reaction I gave you. So A is going to P, uh, and so all of the A that's near the electrode is being used up, uh, and stuff is having to uh, come further and further from the electrode, right, to be in, able to um, be oxidized. And so there's less and less stuff there. Um, and so as you can imagine, then, the current, uh, if I don't stir, is going to go down with time. Um, that will reach some sort of maximum, but then there's just not going to be enough stuff there. Uh, to look at. So let's go back to our stirred um, uh, uh, solution then. Uh, so let's look at these same diagrams if I stir. So this is going to be the distance away 
Um, again, this is a concentration axis. This is my electric surface. We'll call that a distance of zero. So if I stir, now what I do is near the electrode, right? This is my Langmuir, sorry, not Langmuir, no, diffusion layer. Um, and so the concentration uh, at this nerve diffusion layer is always going to be the same. It's going to be the concentration of that bulk solution, right? Because I'm going to be able to bring new stuff there. So what happens then is with time, when I first turn the electrode voltage on, we get curves that look like this. And then finally we'll get one that goes down to zero. And this is the maximum current that I can get. The maximum current I can get is if I've driven the, cur the, the concentration of A at the electrode to zero. If there's no concentration of A at the electrode, then, um, uh, then I'm doing it at the maximum rate. And so if you look at how this kind of compares then um, to our curve, right? Remember when we talked about this is what we would get for a stirred uh, uh, voltammogram, right? When I'm going here at the maximum, that's when I'm getting out my limiting current. Um, and so I can continue uh, to do that. Now we should be able to, let's erase it over here, um, write some equations then uh, for um, what this looks like. Uh, and so it turns out from Fick's law governing diffusion that I is equal to N F A. Uh, times the change in concentration with respect to distance. Oops, I forgot a term. D. D is the diffusion coefficient. So there has to be a term in there for how fast a molecule can diffuse. So that's the diffusion coefficient. What's A? That's the area of the electrode and still the number of electrons. F is Faraday's constant. And so if you look at this, we can actually write out like a term for this dc t um, uh, dx, right? So it would be the concentration of A in the bulk solution, right? Minus whatever the concentration of A is at the electrode. But I said when we're going the maximum, so I'm going to put the L in for the limiting current, we said that was zero, divided by delta, right? The Nernst diffusion layer. So that's the distance that it has to overgo. And so you would get out this, I is equal to N, F, A, D, C, over delta. So before I told you, limiting current is proportional concentration, and I said there was a constant. That's the constant. N, F, A, D, over delta is the constant uh, from fixed laws. So stirring is all very nice, um, and it looks very, it looks very great. Um, but we're not going to stir in our experiment. Um, uh, and if you don't stir, what happens? If you don't stir, you get a curve that kind of looks like this. So you reach a maximum and you start to come back down. Why do you come back down? You come back down again because the amount of analyte decreases. You don't come back down because you don't have enough energy to do the reaction, right? You're still at a potential that's totally sufficient to do the reaction. Uh, but it starts to come back down just because you've depleted, you've used up all of the analyte that was at the surface. So in our, in our experiment, and most of the time, we like to do cyclical temperature, right? Where we go up and come back down. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll go up and come back down, and then we'll switch, right? We'll go the other way. And we'll go the other way and we'll get a signal that looks something like this. Um, and so this is a cyclic voltammogram now. But the thing I always like to remind people is, you know, what's the reaction that's going along, say, here, right? Uh, in this case, the convention we're going to use in our lab is that this is positive, this is minus, so this will be an oxidation. There are two different conventions that can be used uh, so I'll just clue you in as to ours, right? So if we're here, right, we're still doing an oxidation. And you know, in the lab case, it's going to be of acetaminophen, right? The potential doesn't know that you change directions, right? It's not clued into that. All the electrode sees is what potential it's at. It doesn't know what you're going to do next. Um, and if it's at a potential that's over the oxidation potential for acetaminophen, it's going to oxidize it, even if it's going back down. 
so I think a lot of times that's very confusing to people because they think, well, the second that I start going back down, then I should be doing my reduction. And it's like, no, you're not doing reduction. Um, you're still doing oxidation unless you've used up all the analyte or um, uh, you get to a potential that you can't do that reaction anymore. So if we look at this, right, it would be really easy to figure out a peak current, and we'll call this IPA, IPA for the anodic or oxidation current. It's a little harder, though, to pick out the reduction current. For the reduction current, we actually have to take a line, so we don't start at zero, right? If you would look and just go from zero, you say, wow, that's kind of small, even though I always feel lousy job of trying these, it's really small. Um, and so it's more, it's more correct because we didn't start at zero because we, still, we started high because we were still oxidizing things to start there. You would try and take a line that kind of comes back from here and then take that and look at this current for the cathodic current. And if these were perfectly oxidized, perfectly reversible, then IPA should equal IPC if this was well-behaved in a reversible reaction. We're not going to look at a well-behaved reversible reaction in the lab, unfortunately. Acetaminophen doesn't look like this. Uh, but if it was, you know, if, you know, if it was reversible, every molecule you oxidize on the way up, you'd reduce on the way back down. Um, and so that's what it should look like. And there's also something you can learn from the positions of the peaks. So, right, not only could I measure their height and I, right, I could see what potential they happen at. So this one would be... EPC for cathodic, right? And if I would come back down over here, look where the potential happens, right? That would be EPA. And so if I look at that, we can define something called delta E peak, the distance between the two peaks. So delta E peak is equal to EPA minus EPC. And it turns out that this should be a really standard number. Um, that if, if you have a perfectly reversible system, then the distance between the peaks should be 59 millivolts divided by n. So n is the number of electrons, again, um, in the reaction. So uh, 59 divided by 1, if it's a 1 electron process, 59 divided by 2, 30 millivolts if it's a 2 electron process, etc., etc. So the, the distance between the peaks, again, tells you something about whether it's reversible. Now in our lab, we're going to look at an equation. I have this one in the pre-lab, or in the write-up section. We're going to look at the randall sepsic equation. And it's this. It's 2.687 times 10 to the fifth, so there's a big constant. Um, I peak is equal to that times n to the 3 half, d to the 1 half, v, which is scan rate to the 1 half, a, so again, let's define some of these. Little v is scan rate. Uh, so it turns out that um, how much current we get out is dependent on scan rate um, in this um, uh, thing. So let's see what it depends on. All right, it depends on n. That's kind of fun, a funky three, the three halves there, uh, but the number of electrons, right? It depends on scan rate. So as I said, if we go faster will get more current. It depends on the fusion coefficient, right? So, um, you know, the fusion coefficient tells you something about how fast the molecule can get to the electrode. It depends on A, right, the area. Uh, and so if you have a big electrode, right, you will have more current. And it depends on C, the concentration, right? So a high concentration will give you more current. We'll actually have you solve this in the lab report to find out D. Uh, so if you know the concentration, you know the area of the electrode, you know the number of electrons, you should be able to solve it to find uh, uh, D. One of the things I'll warn you about, though, and I warn you in the lab report about this as well, C has a funky unit here. Um, C is going to be in moles per centimeter cubed. You're used to putting um, concentration in molarity, right? And that's moles per liter. And that's a mole per decimeter cubed. So you've got to convert between that and this to make
make all your units work out right. So make sure you do that when you solve this equation. Um, and then you can pull out things like diffusion coefficient.